Hey there, welcome to Neuropod, a channel covering all topics related to Elon Musk's brain chip startup, Neuralink. My name is Ryan Tanaka, and in this update episode, I'll share some of the mind-boggling advancements that will occur as AI and Neuralink intersect. Like for example, let's say you take OpenAI's GPT-10 and pair that with a version 10 Neuralink. I'll share some tweets from Elon explaining his thoughts about AI. I'll briefly discuss Neuralink's treatment of animals and show how Neuralink can see what's happening inside of their implants. And I'll play a clip of Elon saying that at this point, he'd even be willing to let his kids get a Neuralink. I often receive comments like these questioning why Elon is continuing with Neuralink given his concern for AI. For the audio listeners, this specific post says, interesting how Elon Musk publicly concerns about AI, but pursues this. Neuralink is not working on building AGI. Instead, the team is working on building brain chip implants to connect our minds more seamlessly with computers and therefore be able to go along for the AI ride. There are certainly dangers and security risks associated with the surgery and technology. However, if we humans can't quickly exchange information with our computers, we could be left behind altogether, which is another severe risk. For many years, Elon has warned about the dangers of AI. In this recent tweet, Elon reminded folks that he was sounding the AI alarm bells long ago. Six years ago, in 2017, Elon said, If you're not concerned about AI safety, you should be. Vastly more risk than North Korea. This wasn't the first time Elon was warning about the rapid progress of AI. Almost a decade ago, in 2014, he shared this. I don't think most people understand just how quickly machine intelligence is advancing. It's much faster than almost anyone realizes, even within Silicon Valley. And certainly outside Silicon Valley, people really have no idea. If there's some digital superintelligence um, and it's optimization or utility function um, is something that's detrimental to humanity, then it will have a very bad effect. Um, you know, it could be just something like getting rid of spam email or something, and it's like it concludes, well, the best way to get rid of spam is to get rid of humans. He's recently followed it up with a bunch of tweets about the dangers of AI. Here are two of his latest remarks. Don't look up, but AGI instead of comment. And, according to my biological neural nets, AI existential risk to humanity is non-trivial. Another one from back in February, where he says, Having a bit of AI existential angst today. But all things considered, with regard to AGI existential angst, I would prefer to be alive now to witness AGI, than be alive in the past and not. AI is clearly heating up, and the rapid acceleration of progress is starting to cause more concerns for those in the AI community. And here's Elon's thoughts after OpenAI released GPT-4. He says, What will be left for us humans to do? We better get a move on with Neuralink. This was Elon's primary motivation for starting Neuralink in the first place. In order to go along for the AI ride, we must be able to interface or send and receive information to and from a computer much quicker than we currently do. Elon's also been calling for the establishment of an AI regulatory body. Now you might be asking, what are Elon's specific concerns about AI? He elaborated on them here. The least scary future I can think of is one where we have at least democratized AI. Because if one company or small group of people manages to develop godlike digital superintelligence, they could take over the world. At least when there's an evil dictator, that human is going to die. But for an AI, there would be no death. It would live forever. And then you'd have an immortal dictator from which we can never escape. Now, you've probably seen all over the internet the remarkable images that are being produced by Midjourney and OpenAI's DALL-E. And also the sweet responses people get from ChatGPT. OpenAI has made GPT-4 available, and it's capable of doing all this. So now just imagine GPT-10. How much smarter will it be than all of us? Elon recently signed an open letter from the Future of Life Institute that states these key points. 
powerful AI systems should be developed only once we are confident that their effects will be positive and their risks will be manageable. We call on all AI labs to immediately pause for at least six months the training of AI systems more powerful than GPT-4. I've decided to sign it too. If you feel it's worth doing, I'll include a link in the description. Now this brings us back to the question that I hear all so often. Why Neuralink? Neuralink is working to minimize the likelihood of bad AI outcomes. Because, again, if you think about all the recent developments with AI in ChatGPT, Midjourney, and the like, you realize the amazing capabilities of the models while simultaneously feeling the slow inputs we humans give the models. Now this may sound a little ridiculous to say, but we humans type extremely slowly. We have to spend around 60 seconds typing a well thought out prompt to ChatGPT, and it can provide a response in fewer than 10 seconds. Imagine if we reduce the input speed by a factor of 100. By giving ChatGPT a prompt within under a second, we could share an answer to someone else within 20 seconds combined. Now, zooming back out, if you can imagine a world with ChatGPT version 10, where you prompt it with practically anything, and it's able to give you an accurate, detailed response in under a second. Now pair that with a version 10 Neuralink, and you could just think about writing a 5,000 word article about why Tesla is going to continue making their competition irrelevant. And you'd have it in a few seconds. No more thinking about how to compress your thoughts into words, then type them out, and then process the response. Instead, the Neuralink directly feeds your thoughts to ChatGPT, and then taken a step further, that is then shared with someone else's Neuralink for immediate consumption. Fortunately, these AI advancements won't be all bad. In fact, my own personal take is that they'll mostly be good. It's just that the risk of the bad stuff is pretty severe. Regardless, one of the cool things that has been unlocked as a result of AI is the ability to reconstruct images from MRI scan data. A team from Osaka was able to reconstruct visual images from MRI scan data using stable diffusion. The first row is the image presented to the test subject, and the second row is the reconstructed image from the MRI data. This is crazy. Most of the other press about Neuralink has unfortunately been about animal cruelty. I've read through many of these repetitive stories and found that in many cases, the articles are misleading, whether intentional or not. And although it's not really possible to get feedback from the animals about how they're feeling, it's worth revealing what the team members are saying. For example, this is a post from Joe of the research services team. Our commitment to animal care is unwavering, and we take pride in setting the highest standards in this field. Our team is dedicated to ensuring the health and well-being of all animals in our care, and we continuously strive to provide them with the best possible environment. Sure, statements like these can come from any company employee, but I think it's also worth asking whether or not people with these credentials would seem like the people who would not care about the animals. I found these resumes of members of the Neuralink animal care team, and based on their track records and credentials, I bet these folks are taking extra good care of the animals. During the more recent years, the team has begun testing the devices on animals while continuing to test as much as they can in the lab environment. They're even developing their own brain proxies. But as I said, we, we, we do everything we possibly can to test the devices before, uh, not, even, not, not even going into a human, before even going into uh, an animal. So we do benchtop testing, we do accelerated, accelerated life testing, uh, we have uh, a fake brain simulator uh, that has the, the texture and uh, it's like emulating a brain, but it's sort of rubber. And uh, so any, we, we, before we would even think of putting a device in an animal, we, we do everything we possibly can with rigorous bench top, bench top testing. So we're not cavalier in putting devices into animals. Uh, we, we're extremely careful and uh, we, we always want the device, whenever we do the implant, uh, you, if it's in a she sheep or a pig or a um, monkey, to be confirmatory, um, not exploratory, so that we, like we, we've, we've, we've done everything we possibly can 
with bench top testing, and, and only then would we consider putting a device in, in an animal. Also, as further evidence, remember that monkey that demonstrated it could play the video game Pong with just its mind and no joystick? That monkey named Pager is still alive and doing well and had his Neuralink implants upgraded. And I should say both Saki and Pager were upgraded to our late, uh, latest and greatest implants. Um, so uh, that, that's been really over a year and a half now that, that Pager has had f f the, f the first implant and then the upgraded implant. So this is a very good sign that it lasts for a long time with no uh, observed ill effects. While these lab conditions have allowed them to reiterate on the designs, there's simply no better test for how these devices will work in humans than actually doing the trials in humans. This is of course why so many are excited for the day that Neuralink gets approval from the FDA, which could still happen fairly soon, despite the report from Reuters saying that the FDA has rejected Neuralink's human trials applications. Now onto this post from the Neuralink Twitter account. Neuralink is using an imaging technique called microcomputed tomography, or microCT, to capture image slices of the sealed implants. Look how cool it is that they're able to see exactly what's going on inside the implants, even though they're completely closed. I thought this clip was particularly interesting. It was something that Elon shared at the show and tell event. I think if you, if you ask a question like, um, like in my opinion, like would, would I be comfortable implanting this in someone, you know, one of my kids or something like that, if uh, at, at this point, like if, if, if they were in a serious, like let's say they, um, if they broke their neck, would I feel comfortable right now doing it? I would. I, th I would say we're, we're, we're at the point where, I, at least uh, in my opinion, it, it would not be dangerous. Though it may not hold any formal weight with the FDA, this should be a good extra signal to the public that the devices are safe. If you're a new Neuropod viewer and you're interested in learning whether you may qualify for future Neuralink clinical trials, consider joining the patient registry at www.neuralink.com slash patient dash registry. Anyone who is within the United States and at least 18 years old or the age of majority in their state who is able to consent and who has quadriplegia, paraplegia, vision loss, hearing loss, and or the inability to speak is invited to participate in the patient registry. Now, before we finish off this episode, I wanted to share that I recently did two interviews. One was with Dr. Cody Rall on his channel, Tech for Psych. Dr. Rall is a board certified Navy trained psychiatrist who covers technology that can enhance brain performance. He reviews many wearable devices and interviews folks in the industry. I think his energy is great, and I encourage you to check out his channel, especially if you want to know more about non-invasive BCIs. His interview with me is linked in the description. A great person to talk to who knows the Neuralink team quite well is Ryan Tanaka of the Neuropod YouTube channel. His attendance and coverage of the Neuralink press events have given him an inside look to the workings of Neuralink that I think very few people on the planet have. The main takeaway that I had and I also was interviewed by Herbert Ong on his channel, Brighter with Herbert. Herbert primarily interviews notable folks in the Tesla community, but has started speaking to more folks about SpaceX, Neuralink, and Twitter. I think he asks thoughtful questions and also encourage you to check out his channel. His interview with me is also linked in the description. One of them is that I realized that Neuralink is really wanting this to be available for everybody. Like they're designing and architecting the device so that every human on the planet could eventually have an implanted brain chip. I also wanted to include a short tribute to Stanford professor Krishna Shinoy. Unfortunately, he passed away earlier this year due to pancreatic cancer. As a pioneer of neuroprosthetics, a field that paired implanted brain chips with algorithms to decipher chatter between neurons, he positively impacted the lives of many. My name is Ryan Tanaka. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Twitter for more timely updates. Also, if you like this kind of more AI focused episode, check out our episode on OpenAI or our DeepMind documentary. Thanks again.